Oh. Ooh, this is fun. Okay. I did not bring my notes for today, but I think that we should be good. Um, so, let's see. So today, we are continuing with our discussion of growth rates of our runtimes of algorithms. So, um, yeah, and got some slides we're going to go through. Um, I guess, logistically, um, project three is due today. Um, definitely been getting a lot of questions about that. Um, if you have questions after class, come up and ask them. Um, yeah. And also, so I didn't, I just put lab nine up, so it should be, lab nine is good to go. Um, but because I didn't get it up until today, it's not going to be due until Friday, um, anywhere on earth on Friday. Um, but lab nine, basically, you're going to do another experimental analysis of two algorithms, but you're actually going to try different um, input sizes. So for project three, you did an experimental analysis, but you only looked at one input size. You only have, you tried it for 5,000 ints. Um, and in lab nine, you're going to get different algorithms and you're going to try them with, you know, try them with 10, try them with 100, try them with uh, bigger, bigger input sizes. So uh, today's slides. Um, just get those going. Okay, so today our, you know, our goal is going to be to define um, big O notation, which you may have heard about before, and you will cover a lot in 246. So is anyone in here, like, currently in CSCI 246? Yeah, okay, great. So have you covered big O notation yet? We did on Wednesday. So. Oh, okay, so that's actually kind of good timing. Um, so. In my mind, and hopefully this aligns with the department, um, in my mind for us in 132, we want to see, we want to get just a sort of intuitive understanding of big O notation and an intuitive understanding of what do we mean when we talk about the runtime of an algorithm. And really we want that baseline to be, we mean how does that, the runtime of the algorithm grow as the in input size gets larger. So that's really what I want your takeaway to be is we want to understand how algorithms um, behave as their input sizes get larger, be able to characterize that in a general way so that we can, can compare algorithms and say as the input size gets large, this algorithm uh, basically has the same runtime as that algorithm or this algorithm has a distinctly different runtime from that algorithm. And so in a class like 246, we'll get a lot more formal in how do we actually prove that, for example. So I'm actually, I'll go through an example of that, but we're not on a test, for example. You're not going to have to say on the quiz, um, prove that the big O runtime of some algorithm is something. But, but you might have to say, what is the big O runtime of this algorithm? OK. Um, so it would be really cool if my quick time player was already going here. Whoops. What? Oh, OK. I want a new movie recording. And I want my input. Yes, OK, great. Cool. So let's now make this full screen. Okay, so last time um, we started our discussion of analysis of algorithms. Um, we saw um, the seven functions that we will compare our runtimes to. Um, and we discussed how we can run experiments 
um, to compare the runtime of algorithms. Um, and so here, for example, if you think about what we, what we are doing in project three, right? In project three, you are timing an algorithm um, such as you know, your get first method and you are timing it on an input size of 5,000. And so if you think about this slide, um, where, I guess, okay, <laughs> well, one question, um, where would like that data point go? If this was a, uh, looking at, say, add first, but it doesn't really matter, any of our methods, um, maybe this is kind of a trick question, but you have now have a runtime data point. Where, like on the x-axis, where would that go? Yeah, it's, it's off the, it's actually off of our chart here. But the point is to understand that that's just one data point for an input size of 5,000. And so if we want to understand, if our goal is to understand the runtime of an algorithm as n, the input size n grows, we need not just one data point, right? We need all these data points. And so what we would do to get all these data points in, ex in an experimental study is we're going to have to um, run the program with inputs of varying size. And a good way to then try to understand those outputs would be to plot them. Um, anybody, can anybody tell me, have a guess about what, what sort of function does this uh, look like? Quadratic. Yeah, a quadratic, so this looks like it's about n squared. And so after this, we would probably have a guess that this uh, algorithm that we implemented has a theoretical runtime of n squared, um, but we also can analyze that theoretically. Um, and we, so we also discuss uh, limitations of experiments. Um, basically, uh, one big one is that the hardware and software needs to be the same if we're comparing two algorithms and unless I just run them both on my laptop right now, we can't really make that comparison. And I wanted to share this quote uh, from a really famous computer scientist, um, which maybe you find funny, but I, you know, this I would say perfectly, perfectly encapsulates what my experience as a computer scientist is. I do a lot of this more theoretical stuff, so, um, and it can be really powerful because we can understand algorithms without having to implement them. And we understand them more generally than if we just do experimental studies. Okay, so when it comes to theoretical analysis, what are our goals? How do we actually do, what are the basics of theoretical analysis? So, like I've said, our goal is to understand running time as a function of the input size, not just for one single input size, but how does it behave for different input sizes. And if we, so back when we had this plot, you know, I now know, like, what is the runtime for, if this is 50, maybe this is like 20. Like, I have a data point, runtime for at 20, right? And I have a data point here. It's maybe runtime at 30. And I have all these data points, but it's actually a lot more powerful to just say that this runtime behaves like n squared, right? Because I don't have to tell you each one of those data points. I can just say n squared, and we know how we know what that means. Um, so that's what we mean when we say we're taking like. If I characterize a function, uh, an algorithm, as a function, we've then actually taken into account all possible inputs. And this analysis has nothing to do with the hardware or software that we might use to implement it. Okay, so how do we do this theoretical analysis? 
So the first thing that we're going to want to do is break down an algorithm um, into its primitive operations. So some examples here are just evaluating an expression. Um, so like 1 plus 1. Oh my gosh. 1 plus 1. So that would be a primitive operation of evaluating that expression. Um, assigning a value to a variable. If I say, so for example, if I say x equals 1 plus 1, we're actually doing two primitive operations here, right? First, we're going to have to evaluate that expression of 1 plus 1, which is a little messy. And then we're going to have to do the assignment. So um, that actually would be two uh, primitive operations, but if I just had x equals 1, that's just 1. You know, I'm just making that assignment. Um, indexing to an array, calling a method, um, returning a value from a method, these are all primitive operations that we are going to say um, take a constant amount of time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to count up how many primitive operations does my algorithm take in terms of its input size. Any questions so far on what a primitive operation is? Cool. OK, so um, because it's Friday and want to have some fun, um, we are going to uh, get some practice with counting up these primitive operations. Um, and in fact, I have pieces of paper here for everyone to uh, find at least one pair. So hopefully everyone, how many people have a pen or pencil with them? Great, okay, good. Because I only brought paper, I was like, I can't bring pens and pencils for everyone. But I do have paper. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to give, um, everyone should be in either, in a group of at least two people. You can have more than two. Um, one person will be the writer for your group. <laughs> and you're gonna write down everybody's name in your group. Um, so, for example, if Forrest and Austin were a pair, hopefully I got your names right, that would be really embarrassing if I didn't, but if they were a pair, they would write, one person would be the writer, maybe Forrest, he's got his pen already, he's going to write both their names, and then um, we're going to do the first line together, but after that there are this, uh, this algorithm that we have implemented in Java, um, so there's, it has line three, line four, line five, line six, line seven. So maybe I'm gonna, on your paper, we'll do line three together, but you're gonna have line three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And you're gonna just talk with your partner and see if you can write down how many primitive operations each line takes. Um, so for line three, um, if we look at line three, what's happening in line three? Well, we're doing one, we're accessing um, the length field of data. Okay, actually, let's back up. I guess you can talk, you can talk with your partner about what this algorithm is doing, um, but you don't have to write, a, write it down. So talk with your partner about what the algorithm is doing. But for example, in line three, we're accessing the data.length field. That's one operation. And then we're assigning that to n. So that's a second operation. Yeah. We'll say that it, that if we initialize and assign in the same one, it'll be one operation. Um, so I'm going to say that line three has two operations. So um, I'm going to pass out. Yeah. So yeah. And so it's just, we'll just say that that's one operation. Okay. Like accessing the, um, accessing the length field of data is just one operation. Uh, assignment is one operation. So the place that this is going to get tricky, and it's okay if you and your partner don't know exactly what to do, is 
what about and then okay here so when we get to our for loop we're not going to be able to just say oh you know this is five operations right it depends on the input size so you're going to say your input size is n right that's the variable name that we'll use for our oh i guess there's an n here but that's just very typical. We'll say the input size is n. So um, we're going to want to say how many operations in terms of n if we need to. If we don't need to say how many operations in terms of n, then you don't. Like, for example, for line 3, we didn't need n, right? Because there's just no matter how big data is, and let's see, this is the length of data. To be clear, does it make sense that n here is the length of data? Yeah, it's confusing because there's also a variable n, but I think you can probably manage. Um, yeah, so these are, these are going to get a little tricky in uh, lines 5 through 7, maybe, but uh, just do your best. Um, and yeah, I'm going to pass out some papers. Maybe I'll give, yeah. So once we out, uh, we don't know anything about the original standing yet, so we'll never know if we'll have to assign um, current max to data today. So just write out whatever, like a description of what, um, like a range. You can write out a range of number of operations. <laughs> okay, I'll just give papers to, I'll have you pass. Will you, uh, that. But you're required to have at least one partner. If you have to move, that's okay. Um, will you take them and then yes. pass? Required to have at least one partner. Uh, so what? I don't think on this. Great, there's not that many people in class today. Thank you. 
Uh, we're gonna come back together and we'll go through all of this. Um, but yeah, thanks for participating, everybody. That uh, seems like uh, it's going well. So, okay, so, oops. Well, first off, we didn't say, uh, I didn't say it beforehand. Can anybody tell me what this, what is this um, method doing? Yeah, we, we enter an array and it finds the max value. Um, awesome. So, okay, so now we're gonna go through this exercise of counting up how many primitive operations does this take? And we're gonna really try to count every primitive operation here. Um, given that, that the length of data is n. So we already said that line three takes two operations. So where do I want to put this? If I write this two here, is that, is that big enough to see in the back two? Okay, cool. So we said that takes two. Uh, maybe I'll just do it in like red so it sticks out. So we said this takes two operations. So anybody, I talked to one group and we talked about how many line four does. Another group, uh, Want to tell me how many uh, operations we do in line four? We already heard from you. How about this group? Um, we get two operations, uh, declaring the current max variable and the index in data at zero. Yeah, so accessing data at zero is accessing an element of array. That's a primitive operation. And then assignment. Um, we're saying, I'm kind of saying declaration and assignment, we can just count that as one operation. So um, even if, like, even if we had current max, we would still say assignment is a constant, is one primitive operation. If that makes sense. Like, we are declaring it here, but, um, like, if later, for some reason, I had this line that was, like, current max, uh, equals five, I would still say that this is one primitive operation because I'm doing assignment. Even though I'm not, I'm not declaring current, current max, I'm just assigning to it. Um, what about, so okay, <laughs> line five, it starts getting hard. Um, and I think there are a couple ways that we can think about this. Um, so anybody want to give me a guess and an explanation for line five? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so you really have kind of this right idea of like, we're really looking at every primitive operation. So yeah, I'd say we have, so maybe I'll put line five. We have a lot going on here, right? We've got uh, assigning J, we've got assignment. We've got uh, this comparison. We've got incrementing J. Um, and then, so at some point we also have, so it's true, we've got like these primitive operations going on, but at some point we also have to acknowledge that, and I think it would be good in line five, that, I mean, how many times are we actually gonna do that? Sure. N minus two, okay, interesting. So we're going from, um, yeah, so we're starting it uh, from one and we're going, uh, oh yeah, I guess N be, ends up being the same N. Wow, I didn't even catch on to that N being the same N that I was talking about. But yeah, and we're going up to N minus one. So yeah, we're gonna do it N minus two times. So we've got three, uh, things and we're doing them n minus two times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good point. 
and I think that you're right that it actually only happens the first time. Um, I think every time you go through, so if you wanted to be really, really careful about this, um, I think you're right that you'd only count that once, and then you'd say n minus two times, we're doing these two, two things. So you'd say, like, really, it should be, oops. Um, so one time I make j equals one. Oh. Oh, but every time through you have to change j. Oh, but that's, in ca that's accounted for he right here, huh? So, yeah. So let's see. So, I guess really we could say we're doing two things n minus two times overall, if we want to. Yeah. Um, well, okay, why, why would you think it's n minus one? Okay, so what was your example? Okay. Yeah. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I also think you're right. Yeah. Also, the way that we noted it, having the ends, the J equals one, happen just the one time a week, but two times the N minus one plus one. Yeah. That also sounds like. A good call. Yeah. So I'm just reading it for you because I'm, I'm the one who said 10 minus yeah. two in the first place. But we're skipping over the very first value. We're not comparing data to zero. Yep. And then we're yep. not actually comparing n, right? Mm -hmm. Because we stop before we get there. But we do do one. Yep. So if I go from 1 to n minus 1, then I do n minus 1 things. Yeah. And I mean, you said it. I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds right. So, you know. But if we think more carefully about it, we do get n minus 1. So. So yeah, I mean, I think really, in the end, what's going to matter is that we get uh, whether things are constant or whether things are like linear, for example, so whether they depend on n. But I think it's a good, OK, so let's see. Every time we, so every time we either, I think, I think we could just think of doing it two times n minus one because if we think of the first time we, oh no, we have to change, oh yeah, yeah, okay, so you said two n, n minus one plus one because only, yeah, yeah. I think that that sounds right. Yeah. So in this case, it's more than the time counter because it's a separate operation. Yeah, I mean, you're saying, okay, yeah, is like, is this word for its own operation? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. Um, I would say no, um, because the the for loop, like. It's really just giving more, really like, it kind of just specifies what to do. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, so I think it's fine. I wouldn't say like saying that it's a for loop is a primitive operation. It's the things that, that actually happen in, in the for loop. OK, so we got to this one being 2n minus 1. Um, plus one, and I think 
Yeah, I think, I think that's a good answer for that. Um, what about line six? Yeah. T N. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Why? Why T N? So we got to do two. Two things. That's what. So indexing into data and then making that compa comparison is two things. Um, I guess n two n. Why not two n minus one? Well, and yeah, you can, you're a natural, natural algorithms uh, person because really, in the end, we're going to consider n and n minus 1 to be the same thing. But if we're being really precise, I think, then we would just say that we actually only uh, are going through this n minus 1 times. So we, but nowhere in this class will the difference between 2n and 2n minus 1 ever lose you points. So. Um, but it is good to recognize that there's two operations here, accessing and doing the comparison. Um, what about line seven? How about a group farther in the back? I think line seven's maybe kind of the hardest one in a way, or a little bit, uh, we have to use some words. How about this group in the way back? Did you get to line seven? Do you have any guesses? Well, or what was hard about it? Or what might be hard about it? Yeah, so we're in, we're in the for loop. Uh, so that does make it similar to the previous two lines, but the line before it in line six. So sometimes we execute this line and sometimes we don't, right? So that makes this one a little bit hard. Um, does any, anyone have, I guess I saw a hand over here. You want to tell us what you guys wrote down? Yeah, so that would be a nice, like, good formal way to do it. Um, really just, you know, this, you're right, we do this, we basically execute either, you know, two times, four times, six times, et cetera, up to 2n. So, but really, you know, we can just say we're going to do this 0 to 2n times. Or we're going to not do this 0 to 2n times. We're going to execute 0 to 2n operations on this line. Yeah. Oh, and I guess it's 2n minus 1. Thank you. Um, yes, so precisely, you know, when we get to big O in, in some number of slides in the future, we're going to really be thinking about the worst case. So the worst case, the biggest this could be is 2n minus 1. Um, and yeah, any questions about that one? I think just understanding the really important thing for line 7 is just to understand that this line can, because it's only executed sometimes, it can be executed anywhere between 0 and 2 and minus 1. Uh, it can execute that many operations. Um, and uh, being able to write that down is the first step toward uh, being able to write down the big O runtime of this uh, algorithm. And then finally, uh, line 8. How about um, a group? How about one of the groups like on this side? Yeah. Perfect. This just uh, has one primitive operation. Cool. So overall, um, if we wanted to say how many primitive operations um, in the worst case might this um, method take, 
we would just add these all up. So worst case, I'm just gonna add two plus two plus two times n minus one plus one plus two times n minus one plus, and here's where my worst case comes in, two times n minus one plus one, right? So I can simplify this, I don't know, let's see, 2n, 4n, 6n, 6n plus, okay, minus 2, minus 2, uh, minus, maybe minus 1, something like that, 2, minus 2 plus 1. Oh, here's a plus one. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay, I missed this last plus one. Okay, so in the end, we get 6n operations in the worst case. Um, yeah, so counting primitive operations, an important step. Now, okay, so actually, we're going to skip this for now. Um, and get to, okay, actually, let's think about... Okay, actually, no, we're not going to skip this because we just wrote down that our implementation for array max is overall 6n primitive operations in the worst case. And if we also consider a different algorithm that we'll see later in this class, insertion sort, um, this slide is really telling us how, as n gets large, the number of operations that an algorithm takes actually ends up really mattering. Um, so insertion sort, so now we actually know, we know what this means. Like, when we say insertion sort is n squared divided by four, that's saying that that's how many operations it takes in the worst case. And similarly, merge sort takes 2n log n operations. Um, and so if we want to use these two algorithms to sort a million items, um, because of the number of operations that they use, um, if we have an input of a million, insertion sort takes 70 hours, whereas merge sort only takes 40 seconds with and this was done on somebody's laptop or whatever, you know, it's not very fast. Um, but even if we increase the speed by 100 times um, of the actual computer, that's still, so, you know, 70 hours turns into 40 minutes, um, but 40 minutes compared to half a second is still a lot. Very different. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think the big takeaway here that I want to make sure that we understand is these ends like, or what, what these, what this is referring to is the number of operations um, that the, that the algorithms take. In terms, and n is the input size, and the function here, we say f of n is this, f of n is the number of uh, operation, primitive operations that the algorithm takes. What's our tag looking like? Perfect. Okay. Um... So the growth rate is not affected by constant factors or lower order terms. So uh, constant factors, what do we mean by constant factors? In our example, we had 6n. And so we would say the 6 is a constant factor. Um, and so as another example, like this 10 squared is a constant factor. This 10 to the fifth is a constant factor. Um, and if we think about the growth rate of a function, um, how much the value grows uh, from step to step is not affected by those constants. Similarly, lower order terms, um, such as if, you know, if we have this uh, function here, 10 squared times n plus 10 to the fifth, the growth is not affected 
by the 10 to the fifth. So that would be a lower order term. Um, but also in this function, 10 to the eighth times n, even though it's got an n in it, is a lower order term. So we'd say it's lower order because we would say n squared has order two. And n to the third has order three, et cetera. So if the largest um, exponent in my expression, if it's just a, a polynomial, is three, then anything like an n squared, an n, just an n, or a, like a plus a constant, those all uh, do not affect the growth rate of the function. Okay, so on this slide, um, we have the actual mathematical definition of uh, big O. And so what big O allows us to do is say that in the long term, like asymptotically, it allows us to say, give us an upper bound on um, the runtime in terms of n. And so visually, I think we'll, we'll go through this example uh, sort of mathematically, which is more what you do in 246. We'll go through this on Monday um, just so that you see it. Um, but visually, what's important here is actually the picture. And so what's going on in the, pic in the picture is um, that we want to say 2n plus 10 is big O of n. So another way that we could say this is in words, we might say 2n plus 10 is order of n. And so the big O is actually referring to this language of order of n. It's on the same order of the function n. And so what we mean here is if we look at the function 2n plus 10, so that's here, um, and this is its growth. This is, uh, I guess, plotted on a log-log uh, scale. But the function n here, uh, 2n plus 10 is bigger than the function n, right? We can all, like, 2n plus 10 is always bigger than n. But because there is some way that we can shift, we can shift that function n. So we shift it from this red here to uh, this dotted red here. Because there is some way that we can shift it so that that shifted version is actually bigger than our function, which is the blue, then we can say that that our function is actually upper bounded in a way by n because we can shift n. But you know, if our function was something like a quadratic, then there would be no way to, if this was our function, there's no way that we can shift the function n so that it's bigger than uh, our quadratic function, right? So we'll see that formally on Monday. Uh, have a great weekend. Come ask questions about project three if you have them. Uh, see you on Monday. Let's see. Let me try to get out of here. Oh, yes.